त्यांचे माईक म्यूट वर ठेवावे पूर्णमद पूर्णमिद पूर्णात पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्णस्य पूर्णमादाय पूर्णमेवावशिष्यते ईशावास्यमिद सर्वं यत्किंचित् जगतां जगत् तेन त्यक्तेन भुंजीता मृद कस्यसिद्धन विद्याच अविद्याच यस्तत्वेदो भयं सह अविद्यया मृत्युंती विद्यया मृतशुंते ओ शांति 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 मी दाते सरांना विनंती करते की त्यांनी आजचा विषय आणि आजच्या वक्त्यांची थोडक्यात ओळख करून द्यावी हो धन्यवाद आज आपण एका खूप महत्वाच्या विषयावर लेक्चर ठेवलं आहे न्यूक्लिअर फ्युजन आणि ताऱ्यांप्रमाणे ऊर्जा निर्मिती हे ताऱ्यांच्या अंतरंगात ज्या पद्धतीने ऊर्जा निर्माण होते त्या पद्धतीने ऊर्जा निर्माण करायचा एक प्रयोग फार मोठा प्रयोग आहे मात्र अनेक देश एकत्र येऊन हा एक मोठा कॉम्प्लेक्स एक मोठा कॉम्प्लेक्स मशीन फ्रान्समध्ये उभारत आहेत आणि ते खूप चॅलेंजिंग असा प्रोजेक्ट आहे की असा एक तर या प्रकारचा मोठ्या प्रमाणावरचा पहिलाच कमर्शियल बेसिस वरचा रिएक्टर असेल आणि ह्याच्यामध्ये खूप गोष्टी इमॅजिन करायला लागणार आहेत डिझाईन करतानाच कारण त्याच्या नेमक्या कंडिशन काय असतात हे माहीत नसतं खूप उच्च टेम्परेचर असतं आणि ह्या सगळ्या प्रोजेक्टची माहिती आपल्याला देशपांडे सर सांगणारच आहेत देशपांडे सरांची ओळख म्हणजे ते हा जो प्रोजेक्ट फ्रान्समध्ये होणार आहे की इंटरनॅशनल थर्मोन्युक्लिअर एक्सपेरिमेंटल रिएक्टर त्याचे दोन हजार सात ते दोन हजार एकोणीस प्रोजेक्ट डायरेक्टर होते आणि सध्या ते प्रोफेसर आहेत इन्स्टिट्यूट ऑफ प्लाझ्मा रिसर्च अहमदाबादला त्यांनी इन्स्टिट्यूट ऑफ प्लाझ्मा रिसर्च मध्येच पी एच डी केली आहे आणि ह्या महत्वाच्या प्रोजेक्ट मध्ये त्यांचं कंट्रीब्युशन खूप जास्त आहे आजचे दुसरे आपले पाहुणे आहेत म्हणजे चेअरमन आहेत शेखर मांडे चेअरमन नाही शेखर मांडे आज उपस्थित आहेत त्यांची ओळख त्यांना बहुतेक सगळेजण आपण जाणतोच ते मॉलिक्युलर बायोफिजिक्स मध्ये रिसर्च केल्यानंतर मुख्यतः स्ट्रक्चरल आणि कॉम्प्युटेशनल बायोलॉजिस्ट आहेत दोन हजार एक ते दोन हजार अकरा पर्यंत ते डीएनए फिंगर प्रिंटिंग आणि डायग्नोस्टिक येथे सायंटिस्ट म्हणून काम करत होते त्यानंतर सध्या ते डायरेक्टर जनरल ऑफ सी एस आय आर आहेत अनेक पुरस्कार मिळालेले आहेत दोन हजार एकोणीस एकोणी एकोणीसशे नव्याण्णव साली यंग सायंटिस्ट अवॉर्ड ते गेल्या वर्षी फिरोदिया विज्ञान भूषण अवॉर्ड दोन हजार वीस आणि त्यातलं महत्वाचं म्हणजे शांती स्वरूप भटनागर पुरस्कार दोन हजार पाच सालचे विजेते आहेत आणि आज आपल्याला चेअरमन म्हणून डॉक्टर सोमक राय चौधरी आयुकाचे सध्याचे डायरेक्टर आहेत ते चर्चिल कॉलेज केम्ब्रिज मधून एस्ट्रोफिजिक्स मधून पी एच डी झालेले आहेत आणि प्रेसिडेन्सी कॉलेज कलकत्ताचे जिथून त्यांनी पदवी घेतली त्याचे गोल्ड मेडलिस्ट आहेत अनेक रिसर्च करणाऱ्या स्टुडंट्सना ते पी एच डी साठी गाईड करत असतात आणि अनेक शोध निबंध त्यांच्या नावावर प्रसिद्ध झाले आहेत मी आता डॉक्टर शिशिर देशपांडे यांना विनंती करतो की त्यांनी त्यांचं प्रेझेंटेशन सुरू करावं दाते सर हे सगळ्यांना मला वाटतं शेखर मांडे सरांना सॉरी मी इंटरप्ट करतोय शेखर मांडे सर ह्या व्याख्यानाला पूर्णवेळ थांबू शकणार नाही आहेत तर ते काही थोडा वेळ थांबून त्यांना जावं लागेल त्यांना एक महत्वाची मिटिंग आहे पण ते आपल्या या कार्यक्रमाकरता आले खरोखरच हे आपलं भाग्य आहे 
मला वाटते शेजर सर आपण एक दोन शब्द बोलून जरा आपल्याला जर मिटिंगला जायचं असेल तर आपण जाऊ शकाल तर मला वाटते आपण एक दोन शब्द ह्या मिटिंगबद्दल ह्या टेक्नॉलॉजीबद्दल जे आपल्याला सांगायचं आहे ते सांगून नंतर मला वाटते शिशिर सरांनी त्यांचं व्याख्यान चालू केलं तर जास्त बरं होईल खूप धन्यवाद श्रीकांतजी खूप धन्यवाद ऍक्च्युली माझ्याकडे खूपच हर्षाची ही गोष्ट आहे की शिशिर देशपांडे जे आहेत हे माझे वर्गमित्र होते आम्ही लोकांनी एमएससी ला एकत्र होतो विवेक क्लासमेट नावर एमएससी विवेक क्लासमेट ड्युरिंग अवर एमएससी आणि शिशिर हा वर्गातला सगळ्यात हुशार विद्यार्थी होता म्हणण्यात काही हरकत नाही He was the brightest uh, student in our class, and we all used to feel very jealous of him uh, for the reason that he had a lot of cutting physics problems. He had a Jackson book on classical electrodynamics, and he had a lot of problems solved. And he had a lot of problems solved. Problem solve and he had a lot of problems solved. We used to feel very jealous of him that he was so good that he used to actually be able to understand and solve many physics problems. and as luck would have it uh, the, the, he actually landed up in uh, at that time plasma physics program which was being run from the physical research laboratory in ahmedabad and we chose uh, easy option which i i chose literally easy option to go to molecular biophysics because i couldn't have coped up with uh, difficult things like this and she she literally excelled after going to go there and as all of us know uh, for a long time he has led india's uh, uh, representation in uh, the iter program iter program iter which is an international program india actually very early on decided to take part participation Hello, sir. and uh, what happened was uh, basically the whole world is looking at uh, fusion Hello, as one of the nandini chaple tumhi thoda mute kelo to baro hoile nandini chaple tumhi please mute kara tar it's very important that uh, fusion is actually seen as the future of energy in the world and india decided very early on that we should participate in the world fusion program and it was uh, thanks largely due to the efforts of people like dr pk ko and all who decided that india should be equal partner in this programs and very rightly shishir was chosen as one of the leaders who could represent india in that particular program and we are very fortunate that he is here with us today and he is going to tell us little bit about the future economic the what uh, the tokomax and all these things they do but also about india's uh, participation in the eater program so thank you shishir for joining us and shikant sir mala kshama mato thangu sakat nahi pan mi shishir ji andar bolun vichar ki tela kar pan baki sarva lokana mi avan ko ichito ki sarvani ta mute thevla ta aplyala ma shishir cha vyakhyan kharokar enjoy karta hai so i am very sorry that i cannot be with you all of you now but we are all looking forward to shishi's lecture in the coming next uh, half an hour 45 minutes thank you all for this particular opportunity back to you thank you shishi sir शिशिर सर तुम्ही सुरू करू शकता ओके सगळ्यात पहिले तर श्रीकांतजींना आणि सगळ्या लोकांना थँक्यू विज्ञान भारती आणि खास करून शेखरला फॉर सच ए एनकरेजिंग अँड फ्लॅटरिंग इंट्रोडक्शन आणि मी सगळे प्रॉब्लेम जॅक्शनचे सॉल्व्ह करत नाही मी आताच क्लिअर करतो नाही तर मला लगेच इमेल सुरू व्हायचे सो लेट अस स्टार्ट मला जस्ट बहुतेक हे मिनिमाइज करावं लागेल माझा स्क्रीन तुम्हाला दिसतो आहे बहुतेक सो आय विल स्पीक इन इंग्लिश ओके ओके सर तुम्हाला प्रेझेंटेशन दिसत आहे का नाही सर दिसत होत बंद झालं Uh, you can just share but choose the window in which your presentation is open um in Good. that case the video the video will stay this is zoom don't you can just choose one window and you will see your video by side 
no problem. Okay. <clears throat> Open share and then um, I'll just take all the windows and then just choose only the window in which your presentation is already open. Bus, great. Now make it full screen. Done. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I need to move this window a bit to the side. Um, all right. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about nuclear fusion uh, on the the quest for starfire. The, the starfire here is actually, I mean, if there are uh, very young audience, then they are likely to look up starfire and find some cartoon instead. So this is just to tell you that starfire is actually star fire, which means something that fires the stars okay. <clears throat> and a process that has kept them burning for billions of years. Uh, I was the project director for Rich India. Now I'm not. Uh, I was there since 2007 to 2019. And uh, Mr. Ujwal Barua, uh, a highly capable engineer and a great manager, is now leading this effort, um, presenting India at the international forum. Uh, <clears throat> so about the institute, this institute uh, where I work is Institute for Plasma Research. It's in Gandhinagar. And this is a very beautiful picture of our institute and a little, you know, graphics down there which shows what do we do. So <clears throat> first of all, it's a plasma research institute. So we deal with the plasma, of course. And there is basic plasma as well as applied plasma uh, experiments. Uh, we do fusion technology, of course, because that's one of the dream uh, of the Institute. Uh, it is, uh, it has also good international collaborations in the form of ITER. And it has also developed industrial applications over the almost 30 years of its existence. <clears throat> so um, the plan is I'll just talk a little bit on nuclear fusion. What is the energy perspective? What is the status? Uh, what is the role of plasma physics? What is ITER and what lies beyond ITER? So in short, nuclear fusion uh, is a process where atomic nuclei merge with each other, uh, creating a heavier nucleus and releasing energy in the process. And just to give you an example, since we are talking about the star fire, let us take sun as an example, simplest, and that we know very well. So hydrogen is fusing with another hydrogen atom, let's say nucleus, to create deuterium. Let's say step one. The deuterium is fusing again with hydrogen to form helium-3. The helium-3 is fusing with helium-3 to form helium-4. Now this cycle is a bit complex and we will not get into the details. So the net consumption is that we lose four hydrogen. We get a helium, which has again the four nucleons and the net output is 26.7 mega electron volts. In, in physics, energies of particles are often measured in electron volts. And uh, <clears throat> to put, you know, in perspective, if we were to take, <clears throat> let us say, a, an air molecule uh, at room temperature, you know, just, just in our room, that particle would have an energy close to 1 by 40th of an electron volt, very roughly. So we are dealing here with crores and crores upscale in terms of particle energies <coughs> or energies of the photons. <coughs> so here, what we are just saying is that light nuclei merge creating heavier nucleus. So we can go a step further and understand this because this was, you know, it was a big discovery 
and a very detailed calculation by Hans Bethe for which he had this Nobel Prize in 1967, that he actually could show that the, the nuclear reactions, the fusion reactions, their pathways and different pathways, how are they energizing the stars? Because the problem of energy production in the stars, as you know, uh, was, uh, was a significant problem. And it took a while to figure out what is exactly giving us so much energy uh, from the stars. So <clears throat> uh, if we look at, uh, let's not leave the Star Trek for a moment. If we look at this picture, uh, this is a very nice picture, which tells us how much of this entire periodic table gets manufactured in the stars. In fact, everything is made in the stars, of course. We are, you know, stellar products. So <clears throat> if we look at the very early stuff like hydrogen, that, of course, came out of the Big Bang. And uh, there are a number of other stars because the stars also have a life. The massive stars uh, burn out faster. Uh, the lighter stars live a little longer and they have different composition and different densities in their cores, giving them different, uh, let's say, abilities to manufacture uh, different elements. And uh, a whole lot of it can also be understood as a, you know, add-on of uh, helium, for example. You can consider beryllium, add helium into that, and add helium into that again. And you can create a good part of the uh, periodic table. But we have to also remember that the nuclear physics uh, is very fine here. And uh, many of these elements uh, form transitorily and they give way to slightly more stable elements. And in this way, by a number of processes, which we cannot summarize here, uh, a whole lot of elements get formed. Of course, uh, a simple merging uh, or an addition of the nucleons doesn't work beyond a certain point. And we will see in a moment why. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> uh, just as we uh, saw, you know, what powers, you know, stars, it was also very important to understand how can this fusion happen? Because if we look at, uh, say, the repulsive force between uh, ions, let's say, protons, uh, and and say that we want to bring them so close to each other that they have to merge, then their energies are prohibitively large. I mean, there is no way, uh, you know, um, let us say this sun's temperature is around 1000 EV, uh, they would be able to merge with each other. And so this barrier, which is posed by the Coulomb repulsion, has to be overcome. And it was George Gamow's insight uh, who was solving the problem of the escape of, let's say, alpha particles or helium from the nucleus, from inside to outside, okay? That, that insight provided also the way of going uh, for particles to go from outside to inside. And this is very simple. If someone wanted to see a lovely example of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and how you know uncertainties of the position of the particles play in real real life, then this is a wonderful example because particles which would not have been able to climb that barrier, which is posed by the Coulomb force, can actually tunnel through because of the quantum effects. And once they tunnel in, <clears throat> the strong forces take over and the particles merge into a slightly bigger nucleus. So uh, there is a whole lot of stuff one could have talked about it. So let us move on from here and look at the famous binding energy curve, which is used to explain the creation of heavier elements up to, let us say, iron. What happens is that when the nuclei become too big, the the uh, the force 
which they would have traded off against Coulomb force, is no longer uh, supportive of uh, you know drop in their energy. For example, a very large nucleus already particles are uh, the 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 energy. Um, let's put it in a very simple way. Uh, for large nuclei, the addition of any other nucleus does not help. It actually makes it worse. Therefore, this curve starts dropping after iron and something else then works in the creation of those elements. In fact, creation of uh, heavy elements is a topic by itself. And students can uh, very well see that uh, uh, it's still a very active topic. Okay, so <clears throat> now coming back to this issue of stars, the plasma is not present only in the stars. It's there in the interstellar medium, it's there on Earth. It's a very ubiquitous medium. And plasma is, as you know, the fourth state of matter beyond the solid, liquid, and the gas. As we provide energy to matter, the particles which constitute the matter, the atoms, break up into their constituent particles, the nucleus and the electrons. And at, these are energies which are not very high. But when we deal with fusion, the energies are already so high that the atoms don't really remain as bunches of you know, nucleus with electrons going around them. But they appear more as a soup, soup of nuclei and electrons all sort of spread out evenly, overall charge neutral, and uh, basically dancing to the tune of electric and magnetic fields, which are produced by the plasma itself. So this is a very unique state of matter. It is called the queen of physics, the plasma physics, because this is so complex a system. And at the same time, it is so rich a system with phenomena that uh, you know, it has uh, enticed a whole generation of physicists in understanding its dynamics, for example, turbulence, and various phenomena which range uh, right from Earth to interstellar space. So what you see on this picture here is a diagram of density in the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis. And you see different spots which tell you what could be the densities and temperatures of those systems. And what you see at the top middle is the tokamak, the famous tokamak, the magnetic confinement fusion, which is telling us about a density of the order of 10 to the say 18, 19 or 20 particles per meter cube and temperatures of the order of 10 raised to 8 Kelvin, which means 10 crore Kelvin, or if we count in the electron volts, they would be 10 kilo electron volts. So <clears throat> you can see that a whole lot of uh, things uh, have different plasma densities and temperatures, but they are all plasmas. A large a number of tools and tackles developed for plasma can be applied to these systems. And uh, uh, we should not miss, uh, you know, the so the the sun, uh, the aurora, the flames, the lightning. They all be belong to some kind of the plasma. The plasmas exist even inside the metals, in the sense that the plasma-like effects exist inside the metals. So <clears throat> let us come to the energy perspective because that is how we all came to. Uh, came to this point that people would like to exploit fusion energy uh, for the creation and not just for the creation of uh, uh, power, but to take the base load, which means heavy industrial loads, cities loads, those kind of reactors should be built. To distinguish this from, uh, let's say, uh, solar power or wind power where uh, we may not be able to take the base load, but we will still be able to handle the residential and a number of other, uh, other demands. So if we look in perspective as to what is our energy store, what is our inventory, then fossil uh, tells us that we have, let's say around 8,000 gigawatt electric year, which means that you know, if we were to burn 
uh, let's say 7,000 gigawatts, then we would be over with it in one year. Of course, we don't do that, and that's going to last for that many years. Okay. So let us say if we produce 100 gigawatt, then we are going to last for another 80 years or so. Renewable has 102 gigawatt year. This is, of course, renewable, so nothing to worry here because it continuously gets renews, renewed. In the nuclear, we have two components. One is uranium-based systems, which will be 40,000, 40, let's say, gigawatt years, and thorium, which is 155,000 gigawatt years. And this is one of the key points, as you must have seen often in our Department of Atomic Energy's program, the three-stage program, where one would like to move towards thorium because that's a, that's a fuel which is abundant in India, like it is in Brazil. And it's very important that we will then become dependent only upon ourselves. Today, we have to import a very huge fraction uh, of the fuel uh, from outside. And so if we were to become independent, it would be a very major change in our strategy. So, but in order to utilize thorium, one would need to convert the thorium into a fissile material. So thorium-232 will have to be made into uranium-233, and that needs a neutron. Now, this neutron could have come from a fission reactor, could have come from a fusion reactor. So there are multiple interesting uses of fusion, and we will just run down. Uh, well, just to summarize here, I've, I've tried to give as many you know, best references as I can, uh, but uh, you can see that uh, one will have to cut down on the emissions, and we have also promised, so we will have to work towards that. Uh, if you are aware, uh, India's commitment to what is called SDG, the Sustainability Development Goals, uh, should be <clears throat> known to you. It's all there on the web and how much we will cut down, what we will do. Uh, each country has promised and they have to work towards that because uh, the climate is changing. So uh, here is a, a rather old projection. It still stands. Uh, it's still a very ferocious projection in the sense that today we are producing, let's say, around 370 gigawatts. Uh, that's 2020. Uh, but we may need to add another 700, 600 gigawatts or so in the coming years because uh, that is how a standard quality of life measure exists. If there is a, let's say, decently developed society uh, has a reasonable you know, self-reliance, is able to give people all the required jobs, uh, necessary electricity, uh, the right public you know, facilities, uh, has invested sufficient in space, defense, agriculture, transportation, industry, cement, steel, then, you know, if we divide the entire electricity used by everyone else, divided by the people, we will need in order to have a decent life, not just by our standards, it's a UNDP projection. <clears throat> so the life expectancy is connected to the use of energy. And uh, we are having a, an extraordinary shortfall uh, in terms of the final uh, goal. Okay. Now, just to give you an example, uh, if we look at the 2020 data from one side, you can see China produces so many billion units. One unit is one kilowatt hour. So let's say if you use a microwave of one kilowatt and you just run it for one hour, you're going to use one unit. <clears throat> now, this graph on the top left shows you the production, total production and production by coal using coal-fired plants. And you can see we come third in this line in terms of total production. So we produce a lot of electricity. But then if we divide it by the number of people we have, just look at the bottom curve. You can see that, you know, India's adds up to 1857, you know, kilowatt hours. That's the number of units an average individual is 
uh, is having taking a pro rata, which means not just residential, but industrial, everything added together and divided. And look, in comparison, advanced countries like US, Canada, Germany, or South Korea, close to 10,000. So we have a huge factor compared to advanced countries. We are not even world average. We are not even one fourth of world average. So we have a very huge gap uh, in, in contrast to China, which has done almost, uh, let's say, five times uh, better in the last 10 years. So this is just to tell us that, there is, that we need energy. We need to produce energy by whatever means, because it doesn't matter now. We're just too short in everything. On the other hand, if we look at the top right picture, it tells us the composition of the energy production. And there you can see, interestingly, look at the curve for France. It's all orange, meaning that a whole lot of that is nuclear. If, if we look at uh, some of the electricity bills from our ITER friends, they show you on their bill, it shows how much was produced by nuclear and correspondingly how much CO2 uh, production has been avoided. Uh, today, we don't have a choice because we have, that's the only fuel we have. But sooner or later, one has to move toward that. And you can see countries like Russia have moved to natural gas. So where does it, you know, if we look at it gradually, the coal to natural gas is also an important transition. If we look at the hydrogen to carbon ratio, between coal and natural gas or other things. It starts improving. If we go to better and better hydrocarbons, we can go for higher hydrogen to carbon ratios. And that way one can try to you know, mitigate the impact in the interim period on the environment. <clears throat> so let us now just summarize that all types of sources will be needed and they will have to be pressed into service the growth rate needs to be sustained by that. I mean the growth rate of the economy. And remember that we see all the articles in the newspapers that to maintain a certain growth rate, we have to have a certain energy production because we can't build industries. So if we look and if we analyze a huge fraction of the cost of cement and steel is decided by energy. If we can make energy, it can produce energy better if we can do things which take less energy, less water, then also we win. I mean, everything has to be done to improve not just the production, but we must also save wastage, we must be more efficient and things like that. So, and I'm sure there are people working on that. So ultimately, we have to come back to technologies, new ideas, uh, which needs to be developed where the dependence of fossil fuels is minimized. And, uh, and again, coming back to students, remember that uh, especially the PhD students, they have played a major role everywhere, uh, whether it was you know, using silicon. So a professor, uh, uh, if he had not given chance to fair child, it, things may not have gone the way we think they would have. A, a, a troubled PhD student, let's say in CERN who developed internet, another troubled PhD student who found a, a problem with the engines of a famous company, another troubled student who developed, let us say, a, a new source of oil, shale oil. You must have read, you know, Dr. Kalam's book. So uh, a search for academics, a, a desire academic excellence has intricately and intimately got mixed in the creation of new technologies. And they have actually radically changed perspectives. They have changed the game plan. They have changed, taken the game to next higher level. And that's where the students and you know the research comes in. And especially for these challenges which the nation is facing. So coming back to this uh, fusion, the deuterium and tritium have been chosen as the fuel because uh, this reaction can happen at reasonably low temperatures and without significant losses. There are other competing, uh, let us say, components uh, which would not produce neutron, but those reactions are uh, rather expensive, energy expensive, and the return on investment is quite small. 
So over the years, people have perfected this. This is shown results. And we just need to build the right reactor. Of course, initial reactors which we will build will be inefficient, but that doesn't matter. I mean, earlier, we have to think of it like a rocket program. Initially, we build rockets that were small. Eventually, we are building interplanetary missions. So we have to grow in that direction of efficiency and build more compact reactors by inventing new materials. So deuterium and tritium nuclei uh, merge to generate a neutron and a helium nucleus, and they release 17.6 MeV per reaction. And if we want to go into a little bit of details, uh, this is just as let's say a slide for um, uh, some, somewhat someone interested in details. So if we really look at it, uh, this has been written very nicely uh, by uh, in a book by John Besson. So deuterium can be written as two minus this little number, which shows that when the deuterium was made, instead of having you know proton and neutron mass just added, let's say we are talking in terms of, uh, let's say, proton mass. So uh, it would have been two, but because they have been brought, to get brought together and they have now bound into a nucleus and their proximity has caused them to fall in, let's say, a little tighter potential. So their, their mass is a bit reduced from two. Tritium is even more reduced, 0, 006. So two plus three, that's five and a little delta here. At the output, we have an alpha particle, which is helium. And here you see, instead of two protons and two neutrons, uh, which give us four, we have a significant difference here because we have brought them, we have brought more nucleons together. And of course, neutron is a little bit uh, more than one. So if we add up these differences, we see uh, the mass, defect, uh, which we see uh, deuterium, tritium, helium, and then so the net mass defect <clears throat> is uh, such that this delta m over here, when it's multiplied by c square, that accounts for the difference in the energy. If we look at this graph here at minus 0 0.02 and see this uh, figure net here, which means that roughly 2% of the mass defect exists. That means we, have, we are going to lose 2% of the mass because we combine things together. And this mass is going to express itself by the Einstein's relation into energy. And that energy actually comes out as the kinetic energy of the particles, which we then utilize to create uh, power. Now, this is uh, just to share with you an historical thing that Harold Urey was uh, awarded the <clears throat> uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1934, uh, much before you know this uh, other stuff for his discovery of heavy hydrogen, which is basically deuterium. Okay, so uh, deuteros is basically two, mm -hmm. and discovered by Harold Urey, abundant. So we're talking now about how much fuel do we have? We just had seen that so many gigawatt year was, you know, uranium and uh, stuff like that. So here uh, it's abundant, it's there in the oceans. And tritium, which was detected in 1934, is a rare and radioactive isotope, has a life half life of 12 years. But uh, you can make it by using lithium. If we bombard, you know, uh, the lithium, which we have, Everyone is familiar with lithium, lithium batteries, in the laptops and mobiles. So this lithium, when bombarded with neutron, can generate a tritium. Because remember that we are consuming tritium and we can create tritium. And that's the beauty of this reactor. This reactor can generate its own fuel on the fly. Of course, it will not be perfect and it will not be 100%, but we can recover a whole lot of the fuel that was consumed. If we were to surround that reactor's core by a blanket, such that the blanket has enough lithium in it. So Institute for Plasma Research, which is doing research on blankets, has actually created lithium ceramic pebbles, and they're going to try it out on the nuclear fission and other reactors to test them. So 
Uh, here is a little, you know, that there are two types of lithium and that's a detail which you can see later also. So the key point here is that if we can surround the fusion plasma with a blanket containing lithium, then we are home as far as the fuel is concerned. Now, what is a tokamak? The tokamak is just a magnetic bottle. Just as stars hold the plasma using gravitational field, the tokamaks do so using magnetic field. But then there is a, a little caveat. The magnetic fields uh, are like thread lines and the particles are like gyrating beads on that. And unfortunately, the magnetic field does nothing to stop a particle rolling along itself. It only prevents it going across. So if we were to make this magnetic line into a circle, then of course, the bead will come back to itself even if it were to go many times around. Because there are a few other things, we have to just shape it in a proper way and we can create a toroidal bottle. And that's a tokamak invented first by Russians and declassified in 1958 Geneva meeting uh, for the peaceful uses of atomic energy. So basically the random thermal motion of the particle uh, can cause them to hit each other. Uh, of course, they will scatter most often, but every now and then they are going to undergo fusion because the fusion cross-section is also finite. And uh, no matter how rare the occurrence, the energy is very substantial. We invest, say, 20 keV and we got almost 20 MeV. So we've got a factor of, you know, let's say 1,500 here. And just to tell you that this is different from inertial confinement fusion where uh, earlier there was a research at RRCAT. It's a, there's a research ongoing in the US uh, uh, in the national labs where a large number of lasers are fired and a tiny pellet of deuterium tritium is suddenly created uh, with shine with the plasma creating uh, you know, fusion. But of course, it's a tiny pulse. And of course, that has also its own important, uh, let's say, uh, applications. For example, in dealing with very complicated, let's say, weapons, okay, or dealing with an equation of state of matter at extreme energies, temperatures, and magnetic fields. So here is a very uh, catchy cartoon by Boris Kadamsev, a legendary figure in plasma physics, especially tokamak physics. And uh, this was uh, a gathering of various, uh, a, a meeting of uh, tokamak physicists where he had drawn these cartoons. And uh, this uh, tokamak actually is like a solenoid which is bent upon itself. And here is a book, uh, it's a Uh, Deshpande sir, Sumi, Sukun mute zhalai bhoote. Kya maa zhalai? Atta ek second da bhoote, ek don second da bhoote. So, the, um, the tokamak is basically a magnetic bottle and uh, it is because of its geometry, because of its uh, achievements, it has reached a stage where a number of complex characteristics of the tokamak have been revealed, especially how does a turbulent plasma behave? Okay, what are the transport uh, properties of such a plasma? Because your ultimate aim is to heat the plasma, heat it to fusion temperatures. Now the problem is if we put more power in the plasma, does that energy, does that power stay? Or does it just vanish? Is plasma magnetic cage a leaky bottle? That is the question. How long will this energy stay? And so all efforts, especially physics who deal, physicists who deal with turbulence and complex systems, have put their heads together and have come out with better and better ideas. And today we are at a place where we are actually able to conceive a good reactor. So <clears throat> there exists. Uh, I mean, the fact that you have 
put a, a complicated group of uh, you know interacting particles together means that you have already made them out of equilibrium because given to themselves they would have spread everywhere thin and equal but we have brought them together we have made a dense plasma we are trying to heat it we want to maintain a profile so we are driving it away from thermodynamic equilibrium and such systems as we know in nature tend to find ways to come back to equilibrium instability is just a, a manifestation of that desire of the plasma so if we ask ourselves a very simple question what will it take to make a a, a reactor which is economic viable, which means I put in a certain amount of energy and I get more energy out of that. And for that, a simple formula has finally come up out of a lot of scalings and which, which simply says that the product of density and temperature, which is let's say like pressure into the confinement time should be exceeding 40. Now, this is of course a very complicated system of units that we use, but we are reaching that point. I mean, I would like to tell you the encouraging news that the world has moved a long way uh, in that direction. <clears throat> Here is a, a, a interesting picture of Dr. Kadomshev, uh, and on the on the blackboard, if you see carefully, you will see on the y-axis he's trying to plot the diffusion or the transport coefficient of a plasma, and trying to understand that. Now, on the right, you will see. A, a rather complicated picture, which symbols may not make sense to you, but on the x-axis, it's tau, which means it's a, it's a symbol for time. And it's a theory, it's, it's theoretical prediction based on basically empirical prediction, which means you collect lots of devices, you normalize their data, and you try to predict what would have been a confinement time according to the theory. And you then correct take a scale exactly in the same gradation, same spacing, make it vertical, and plot the experimental points on that. And if you get a 45 degree angle, then you are home. That means your predictions are more or less matching your experiment. You will see lots of little dots and colors, which are actually the names of the devices that have pitched in for the last, say, 20 years. And on the top right, you will see a star eater, which tells us that the eater's confinement time is around, say, 3.6 or 4 seconds. So uh, the entire effort is try to predict eater's confinement time as accurately as possible because the, everything depends on that. You know, the design of the reactor, how much power to put in, and correspondingly, what kind of, you know, uh, power supply systems, uh, Etc. Because when we put power into tokamak, let's say, let's say one megawatt, we have to spend almost two megawatt for it because the systems that convert the electrical power to, let's say, radio frequency power are 50% efficient only. So we will have to really work up our way to make it a net gain reactor eventually. So <clears throat> there was a very fascinating and passionate case presented by our founder director, Professor Kao, in the IAEA conference, General Assembly in 1992. It's available. Uh, so where he argued that the countries, the, this, the countries which are basically uh, having large population and less power are the ones who really need it. Because there was a famous statement by Artsimovich that fusion power will develop only when people need it. Because otherwise people keep on arguing that this is always 20 years away, this is always expensive, but that is how you know that system is. We will have to make it work. You have to ask yourself, what happens if it works? Will you be in a position to cash in? So uh, in uh, 1986, when Institute for Plasma Research moved to its new campus, and uh, eventually moved under DAE in 1994, there are two tokamaks at IPR. One is Aditya, which was the first to discover the intermittency and the complex transport mechanism. And then the next is uh, SST1. Uh, I'll just try to see if uh, this, 
a video works and i'll have to stop this share and just play that I see this. Okay, back to your slide, but maybe there's a link there. Ha, the problem is, I think I'll have to try try clicking on the link. It might actually bring up the video. I did that. Um, I think it will, but my I have shared only the presentation, so yeah. I'll have to probably. Um, go out and yeah, share. I'm sharing the screen, so I should be able to. <clears throat> ah, now, if you open the video and then share it to the paper. Okay. So. <clears throat> Uh, are you able to see this? So we can hear it, not we cannot see it actually. Okay, fine. So let me see if I can. Uh, uh, how do I? <clears throat> I have to share the screen. Okay, let me share the video. This should be work. This should work. Okay, let's see. Maybe you will see this. Are you able to see now? Yes, yes, sir. yes. So this is a machine <coughs> which uh, was built. I'll run through it very quickly. Uh, this is these are old photographs which show the realities of making a magnet. Uh, you know, making these complicated forces hold together, uh, the buckling cylinders and stuff like that. And uh, <coughs> eventually, a stage came when we had to change the machine to. A better configuration and we are very happy to tell you that we went beyond its design parameters although it is a very old machine <coughs> we were able to make it work so as we understand more you know <coughs> so so it got a new vessel and the new vessel allows it to <coughs> do more better flexible experiments uh, with shaped plasmas and so this happened let's say in the last uh, four years or so and uh, they have you can see our website uh, they have done a great job and uh, so this this is the new aditya which is let's say the aditya u which we call aditya upgrade and uh, so let me now stop share here and go back to the presentation. Uh, I hope you are able to see the presentation now. So the SST one, uh, hello? Yes, sir, we can see. Okay. So SST one is a tokamak, uh, which is different from Aditya in the sense that it has superconducting coils. We had many setbacks on this machine, and uh, it was it became a very painful point for us. But finally, people got it working too, and now we are looking up to make it work to its intended uh, original goals. For example, uh, to drive current in the plasma using the radio frequency waves. It's basically wave plasma interaction, or to remove the heat from the plasma in a steady state manner. So to demonstrate active cooling for a long pulse operation, to develop you know, superconducting technologies to run those systems and use with that experience uh, as, it, as it went by, one was able to qualify for, uh, along with the technologies that were being developed, to qualify to do work on ITER. So IPR had several you know, important 
little pieces of technology is being developed, like how to make a blanket or how to make, let's say, a high quality tungsten tile, which will take almost five megawatts per square meter in a, in a long pulse. So we had to set up facilities. Many facilities and laboratories uh, were set up in those uh, 10 years uh, to develop this. So while that was happening, uh, the movement of the international partners towards actual fusion reactor also continued. They had built uh, very large machines in the past. And those machines were also reaching uh, their end point in terms of their goals. So you will see JET, Joint European Taurus, a multinational undertaking of the Europe uh, reaching, let's say, the reactor ignition conditions. So this progress happened because we understood physics and especially because a whole lot of students worked on these machines develop new diagnostics, develop new insights, and develop extraordinarily high quality, massively parallel codes, which gave insights into the turbines. So in 1994, there was a breakthrough where the tokamak first time produced almost 10 megawatts of fusion power. Then later, the European uh, tokamak, joint European Taurus, say 9th November 1991, declared it has produced 1.5 megawatts and eventually it produced 17 megawatts of uh, fusion power. So there is a long history of fusion research worldwide and step-by-step -step achievements that have given a basis for ITER. So ITER is an international undertaking which was originally only four partners. So, and it came out of a outcome of a diffusion, let's say, or close out of the Cold War in Reykjavik summit, 1988. And uh, you can see very interesting history of that on either side. So there was a joint implementation meeting, then China and Korea joined in 2003. Uh, they, there was a bidding, who will bid bank ITER. So there's a site in France, Southern France, where it was agreed to build, then ITER agreement was signed, uh, and ITER organization was created. So at this Elysee Palace, you will also see the, in this photograph, you will see uh, the <clears throat> chairman of the AEC, secretary DAE, uh, Dr. Kakodkar signing it uh, on behalf of India. So the goal of the ITER project is to demonstrate generation of energy using tokamak device and for the peaceful purposes. And ITER construction is shared. Uh, seven parties contribute uh, components and systems. And the host party, which is Europe, uh, takes care of almost 45.5% of the construction uh, costs. So this machine, uh, this building is now complete in the sense, this is a slightly older picture. But uh, what you see here is <clears throat> what is called the tokamak complex, this first block of building here. Behind that, what you see is the assembly building. Uh, these are almost 60 meter tall buildings, okay, because they have cranes and they have to lift very heavy components. And at the, at the back, you see a building which is sort of long here that is actually built by India, by Larsen and Tubro. This is the example of the civil construction on the French soil. This is a place where we sub-assembled large pieces of the cryostat, the outer jacket of the eater. And then they were made at site and they had to be transported on rails, like we transport a spacecraft into this building. And that all has been done and very, exciting videos exist of that and we will not uh, look into that because they are really available easily. So uh, in ITER, many people have to contribute because there's no way, uh, you know, you could have produced that kind of superconductor over, you know, thousands of kilometers of length of that kind by even one party. So different people have manufactured, let us say, the conductor, superconductor, different people have wound it into magnets because it requires a heat treatment 
then for example the us built the central solenoid which is like a transformer a superconducting transformer the europe and the koreans built the vacuum vessel india has built let's say the shields and so on and this is also a very interesting uh, site and live site you can see the live construction uh, uh, cameras at iter so uh, iter is basically funded by the department of atomic energy and ipr is a nodal agency for that and to for specifically for supply of the components to iter uh, we have a, an empowered group here called iter india which has an empowered board and this group is able to you know design uh, launch contracts uh, get it manufactured do the quality oversight uh, take care of the components carry out the shipping take it all the way to france go there in france join the installation commissioning and testing make all the documentation on the way make sure that all the regulatory and safety compliances are met and a whole lot of stuff so it's basically a mini eater in india and this group of people of 150 is now expert they can build research infrastructure around india because they know the entire life cycle so they can probably eventually go into a group which will actually build uh, a fusion reactor of course it will require help from various other units uh, who, who are experts in nuclear in materials in handling industry and stuff like that so what are the functions and roles so if we ask very simple four question like how does one heat the plasma so and what is the role of india then let's say india's role is to supply certain types of radio frequency sources which operate between 35 megahertz to 65 megahertz and 30 megawatts of these sources will be supplied from india to it so that's how we're going to hit there are three uh, different systems uh, but one of them is being built by india uh, how does the how does one shield the exterior from harmful radiation and that happens because we provide it with uh, a very special shielding with high boron content so these are steel blocks which we manufacture in india and send them we have completed this job too because the, all the shielding is already at iter site how does one ensure that the magnets remain superconducting uh, for that you need to have a cryogenic supply network that means tiny pipes which carry the cryogen all the way over 200 meters without loss of you know temperature margin or without picking up any heat on the way you have to provide at a specific temperature and pressure to the magnets and that's what we have built and where does this extracted heat go iter does not produce electricity it will only show the demonstration of energy so we will be removing it by conventional means just the water cooling uh, so the primary water cooling will be provided by the us and the secondary water cooling package will be from india and that has also been done so <clears throat> we have lots of uh things to show we will just show you one or two slide here so <clears throat> there is a lot of manufacturing that has happened of india's packages because we started long back in 2012 or so now those packages have completed their manufacturing their quality testing have been assembled at iter site and iter is now ready to go iter is planning to prepare its first plasma in 2027 and uh, they will close the cryostat in probably 2025 so they need about two years time for other things so what you see on the left here is the empty cryostat and of course this is the artist representation at iter this cryostat is actually sitting in a well in a well of concrete <clears throat> and we have supplied uh, this cryogenic piping network yesterday we had a close out ceremony of uh, the last shipping Uh, from the inox india in baroda uh, joined by various dignitaries so we have finished with this package too <clears throat> so basically we are supplying components and systems to iter and we are not just supplying but we designed we had a conceptual design we converted that into an actual manufacturing design with indian industries so we have 
Therefore, Inter Alaya built a certain capacity in the Indian industries. And it would be great if we can continue to do that and keep that knowledge with the industry so that when we need it, they are there. So what happens after ITER <clears throat> is that since we have several technologies being developed, like blankets, beam technology, which are useful elsewhere too, uh, these technologies will give us a base. They will give us a base to, to build our own react. <clears throat> and so our roadmap for the Indian demo goes via Aditya, SST-1, ITER, fusion technology development. But before we go to Indian demo, we need to build an intermediate machine which is made entirely by ourselves so that we know all its problems because we are dealing with 10% of ITER, not all of it. And therefore, we have not yet sized and faced and confronted those problems. So we need to make an integrating platform for testing our own technologies. So this demo would be a large undertaking. Uh, there are many designs of demo. It turns out that uh, a reactor of the order of 2000 megawatts to 3000 megawatts uh, would be the right size because we are forced to choose large size reactors today. But tomorrow when we get better, you know, high temperature superconductors, uh, like, like we are seeing now in US, <clears throat> we might be able to build a much more compact reactor. Interestingly, the cost of ITER, the time it takes to build them, has created a new breed of uh, public-private partnerships all over the world. For example, the Tokamak Energy in UK, the uh, Commonwealth systems in the US, General Fusion in Canada, and a number of other companies have now started making a bid for a reactor. And the recent uh, Fusion Energy Conference was actually summarizing that. So a new generation of uh, industry managers and physicists is now entering this because there are many useful things even otherwise in this, in this undertaking. So, <clears throat> Here is a, a picture of, uh, of, of our dream that we would like to build demo, but on the way we might build an interim device with multifunctional capability. For example, we could use this to create a volume neutron source and testing materials at extreme energies. A unique engineering material science and metallurgy experiment. Second thing is we could use these neutrons to ameliorate the nuclear waste. We could reduce, let us say, the thousands of years of decay, which is required by iron 56, to just a few years, which will then make it possible to reduce the cost of monitoring the fission waste. So, and of course, we can create pulsed, tiny fusion cores, which can add on to make a large, fusion reactor too. So uh, this is what one would like to do. It would like, one would like to demonstrate generation of electricity, ability to connect to grid and stable, whether we have a stable grid or not, reliability, safety, maintenance, et cetera. And you might like to see uh, a very interesting US white paper, which was presented in the uh, Congress uh, called Bringing U.S. Fusion to Grid. That was very recent, just a couple of months back. So research on fusion energy needs young people. It needs industries and institutes to come together. And there's a whole feast here, plasma physics, neutronics and nuclear engineering, material science and metallurgy, tritium technologies, which are used everywhere. Uh, we may remember that tritium technology is also used for mapping water underground. Radio frequency, they are used else everywhere, wireless charging. You might have seen buses in Korea getting charged remotely. Okay. Energetic beam science and technology, which gives you a new window onto materials, 
creating new materials, cryogenics, and of course, robotics and remote handling, everyone knows today that is a major thing in, let us say, handling crisis, uh, surgeries of very high type, uh, for example, rescue operations, dangerous missions, that's where robotics and remote handling is useful. And fusion is one of the platform where you are handling, you know, hundreds of kilograms over a great distance. Today's robotics and remote handling uh, is not so developed that it can, it can uh, tackle fusion problems. But because we would like to handle a blanket, let's say, of half a ton over a distance of 10 meters, remember the kilogram food torque you are creating and what kind of you know, uh, gears you will need, what kind of systems you will need. So you can now think big, massively parallel computing, data analysis, uh, of course, uh, everyone knows its uses, uh, artificial intelligence making your lives easy. For example, uh, you could cut down uh, routine jobs and create opportunities for people whom you are not using to their fullest advantage, if you can couple that with, uh, let's say, artificial intelligence. And of course, one needs to build high tech and high capacity test facilities, which are expensive, but they can be built with industries in such a way that people, universities, industries, and institutes can are able to share that. And no one has to reinvent and build those facilities again and again. A facility can keep growing. So these are some of the footprints that these uh, you know, research will leave on us. And therefore, we once again need young people, we need industries and institutes. Young people would come from universities to come together and form a new platform where you know, mega science projects like you know, ITER, LIGO, you know, SKs and INOs can be dealt with. And you can one day make those components in India. So my appeal to you is do contribute. And I thank you for your patience and uh, giving me your ear. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, it's fantastic. Uh, Nandini, are you there? Shrikanji, pude carry on karta. Nandini, bhote kai mahid nahi mala thila aiku yatai ki nahi. Okay, sir. So let's let's take some questions. Maybe uh, SGK sir, uh, if he's there, he can just read out some questions from uh, chat box, and then yeah, I mean, if you can answer some some of them. And then uh, we will ask uh, Somakra Choudhary sir to um, give his comments and some remarks. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's see what questions. There are a lot of questions up there. In the yes, there are a lot of questions. Uh, SGK sir, can you please uh, read out some questions? Okay. He also is. I don't know. I don't understand. Where is he? I can do that. Okay, sir. Okay. Let me see. So um, actually, there are quite a lot of questions that were asked all through because I, I actually had muted. Um, uh, I also did not see them. So there are several of them. I can, I can, I can uh, um, uh, read out a few here from the chat box itself. First of all, you had started, I mean, it's a wonderful talk. Let me say you uh, say this, is, this was great. It was an eye opener for, for, for everybody and it's done it at, at the real, um, uh, real basic level, um, you started by saying the solar corona. So people are talking, um, asking about uh, what is the connection between the solar corona, what is the solar corona, and the kind of uh, energetics that you're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> what I gave was an example of uh, what happens in the sun. And uh, in the initial slide, we said that fusion between hydrogen leads to creation of energy. But we really did not 
mention how the energy actually flows out all the way to the top of the sun. Actually, uh, probably the people are uh, aware of uh, a big uh, scientific background. So let us say that sun is like um, a ball whose outer surface we are able to see. And there's a core, an engine, which is generating a whole lot of power. And this energy generation is actually, uh, is such that those, you know, those radiations, we would not be able to see. Those are different radiations. And the sun being so dense, in fact, probably 150 times denser than water, at that density and at that temperature, the radiation and the matter are going to frequently interact and everything is going to finally acquire a certain, certain temperature, certain distribution. So by the time the radiation from the sun comes all the way to the top of the sun's surface, this, let's say the place from where it is released, it is already many years by the time the photons actually leave the surface. The solar corona is actually the portion visible to us usually in the total solar eclipse. It's actually an aura, a, a plasma which is emanating from the sun all the time. It's the matter being lost from the sun. It's of course very intense and illuminated and so but obviously it's not as bright as sun. So unless we put a disc, let's say from a space station against the sun, or unless there is a total solar eclipse, we won't be able to see that so easily. So the solar corona is basically just a part of the sun. It's much cooler, uh, uh, much, much rarefied in terms of the density. And, but it is also at a high temperature compared to the sun because there is something very interesting going on in the sun. The sun's core is actually at a lesser temperature. It's very dense, but at a lesser temperature, whereas a certain portion of the sun out there, which is called corona, is actually hotter than the center of the sun. And this funny thing is because of the magnetic fields and the waves and the turbulence, which cause the corona to be heated. So what we see is, the top surface of the sun and of course we see the corona. The, there was no fusion reference to corona. It was just to tell so that's you. That's very interesting. Uh, thank you. I, I think it's, you know, I mean, the sun center is say 20 million degrees and then the surface of the sun is only 6,000 degrees and then in the corona you go out there, it's again in million degrees. Yes. That's very, very interesting and, and because our eyes only see light, yes. only the 1,000 degrees surface but what is at million degrees is actually emitting x-rays. Yes. So the the x-ray telescopes and the UV telescopes yes. see the, the corona of the sun, but you can't. So that's very, very interesting connection. So you see that there are a lot of people here who come from various backgrounds in the audience. So there are people who are school children, people who are all kinds of... So there are some very basic questions and I, I like to take a couple of the basic questions. So one of them is asking, this is MS Sheikh who's asking, um, can you, how can you control so much heat? And fusion high temperatures required a million degrees Celsius, but then what is it that controls the heat that comes out? Uh, this is a very interesting and I mean, most logical question to, to occur to anyone. The plasma is indeed very hot. And what we need to distinguish is the difference between the temperature and the heat. Although the plasma particles are of extreme energy, they are certainly not as dense as the matter that we normally encounter. And therefore the heat content within the plasma is actually not so much. However, if we expose a, in a portion of a material to plasma particles, they are going to cause erosion of that material. These particles are going to knock out the particles of the material, for example, the steel or the tungsten. And therefore, as long as the erosion of the surface is acceptable and we are able to replace it after a few years, we can allow that to happen. 
but the central point is the material has to be supplied with a coolant at the back let us say water cooling channels and so let the plasma flame come to this plate and let the let's say water or helium or other coolants remove that heat on line so it's a dynamic equilibrium heat is falling on the material and water is removing it and what matters is heat rather than the temperature we have to remove the heat that's excellent so i mean that's a related question which is also very basic amol sutar is asking um so um you've confined uh, confined the plasma and having this reaction but how is it being converted into electrical energy how uh, this is this is also a very interesting question and we are we are actively working on it basically uh, once the plasma fusion reaction start the neutrons the 14 mev neutrons will fall on a layer of stainless steel which is called let us say a blanket and this blanket will have coolant just like we uh, pass water at a certain temperature in the blanket it comes out as very hot water like in a fission reactor and this hot water at high pressure is then used to create steam and steam is used to drive a turbine so that is the plan one has not done that but that is something doable because we know that side of the story because we do it regularly on, on fission of course the heat exchangers will be different and so on so let's take one of the more advanced questions dr anil mohari has asked there are many new topological phases of plasma are being detected so is there any practical implication for them the new kinds of plasma that are being uh, detected or for for the similar generation of power uh, you mean i i believe that they meaning alternative ways of producing fusion power right yes there are some Uh, interesting ways uh, which have to prove their uh, for example there is a a neutronic fusion there is a boron hydrogen fusion there is a proton lithium fusion so what people are doing is in accelerator facilities uh, in japan they are going to produce uh, a whole lot of neutrons uh, by these kind of reactions or by spallation and study whether those reactions are capable of producing uh, you know energetically and economically viable uh, reaction rates because there are several uh, processes uh, which are which need to be established before that so uh, there is a um, there are interesting questions uh, at various levels uh, um, so let me ask you one question from aditya shiddapur who's asked Uh, we are using lithium here to generate tritium in the chain that you uh, um, talked about but the lithium is something that's used in batteries and it's great demand for it so uh, how can you justify the use of something that's great demand in something such is uh, it's such an intensive thing like this uh, the the um, available tritium if we go by the current uh, estimates Uh, is actually quite large but even if we consider the case of uh, uh, running out of the mining there are several plants in the sea they also have lithium and so one will have to find a way of uh, generating it in a in a economical manner otherwise the production of the fuel itself will become very expensive however the uh, fission reactors do produce significant demand of tritium and they do so by using uh, the interaction of the neutrons with heavy water there is enough heavy water in the sea so in principle it is possible to produce tritium even using heavy water that's 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 great uh, I mean, uh, if i may uh, so much sir yes. if i may we are now the time is i mean we are overflowing on the time so maybe we can take a last question and then you should have uh, your closing remark i think that will be can i read out the last question i think there is a last yes, i think so and that is um, the this question from pankaj kumar nadwarlal who essentially says what is the benefit of all this for graduates of physics 
what is the benefit of all this to to graduates of physics students of physics how can uh, students of physics benefit from this yes i think that uh, i mean if we look at it academically uh, they have several possibilities of doing their projects their thesis their research in the diverse multidisciplinary areas which are in fusion it doesn't have to be just plasma physics all the time you could be designing let us say a laser diagnostics which for example an mit phd student did and the application of the diagnostics was that there is a magnet which has been wound by conductor and let's this is superconducting magnet and you have a helium field in that because you have to keep it cool but what happens is that if there is a quench if the magnet doesn't suddenly work or has a heat pulse then there is a tremendous helium pressure built inside the magnet now can you detect that quickly by an optical fiber so you see you are innovatively designing sensors and actuators and so this academically they have this strong uh, let's say advantage and we hope that uh, through industries and through scholarships and eventually jobs when we want to build our own reactors not just in you know in plasmas and fusion but elsewhere too they will have that advantage thank you very much i think i think it's a very exciting prospect for physics students and thank you i, I think uh, the talk was wonderful um, I, I, what I liked about your talk was, uh, as uh, Dr. Mande said at the very beginning, you were the best physics student in class. And <laughs> you got out. Uh, got yeah. out. <laughs> Probably, got yeah, out. <laughs> we have to thank Dr. Mande for the encouragement. Wonderful uh, interview. And he yes. himself he was one of the, actually, uh, to tell you the secret, he was one of the best students in the class. And we had very lovely interactions with his with his father, who was actually a very prominent. Such a great Chintamani Monday, of course, professor. And I think uh, uh, um, uh, Shri Kanji can probably somehow copy this chat box and whatever else we can. We can try to post those questions later. Sure. Because I think once the meeting is over, the chat box is empty. That's so, right. We can collect all the other questions. I just wanted to, uh, to, yes, go ahead. Uh, um, yeah. um, no, I, I, yeah, that's I just a wonderful wanted... idea. That's a wonderful idea. We'll copy the questions from the chat box and I will try to uh, answer them, yes, yeah. individually, because the time is so short. And I think your lecture was so encouraging. And so it must have given a lot of people to uh, pose. I, I'm questions. glad that it led to questions. <laughs> yes. I, I just wanted yeah, to conclude by, by have... saying one thing. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Just one second. We don't have to copy it. We will get the uh, uh, all those things in text box. So I'll I'll send you. Yes, I'll no send problem. You. Yeah. You can you can just save the chat box. Yes, yes, yes. I, I wanted to I wanted to conclude by saying one of the major things that's happening in Indian science now is that uh, you know Atmanifar Nifar is not just a buzzword. We are doing things ourselves. I mean, when even when I was a student and and Shishiji was a student. We grew up in an environment where we thought if we wanted to do experimental work at the cutting edge of science, we have to go abroad. Or, and then we, a lot of us went abroad. But now a student can do, dream of doing cutting edge science on Indian soil in Indian facilities in other countries like ETA, LIGO India, like you know, all that, uh, all SKAs we talked about. We are now members of CERN, et cetera, et cetera. So as Indians, we can actually do in science science in India. In, uh, before this, cutting edge science, we had only could do theory and mathematics, but now we can do this. And these mega science projects that are coming up, I am involved in LIGO, for example, and yes. TFC, and, and then uh, and ITER, of course, your, your team in IPR, a lot of people there are involved in LIGO India. So these things are happening and it opens up opportunities for Indian industry. You saw what Larson and Tubro is doing in ITER, right? Yes. In French soil. And it opens up opportunities for Indian students. Indian students can confidently uh, grow up knowing that they can work in India and Indian facilities. And in fact, just the reverse is going to happen very soon. You will find foreign students coming to us to work with our facilities in our country. We don't have to go to America anymore. So this is, this is the way forward. And ITER, as we heard, is not just one of the major um, 
ways of generating energy, it is showing the future of, yeah. of, of power generation of energy, uh, which is, of course, one of the things. But the path to this yeah. is this research project that opens up all these facilities for, for industry. And I, I'm so glad that you arrived at that conclusion independently because, you know, ITER has actually uh, created a tagline uh, in the beginning and in latin it actually means the way the way. way to go for internet collaborations and you know building building capacity you see it are led to build up capacity in various countries and for example the large superconducting wire fabrication industry in korea and china which was made for it is now without any work for eater now it's or now they are making mri wires exactly so you see you always find the the system finally finds a way you just have to have the capacity the rest is taken care of by the creativity so number of people have actually discovered ways of keeping themselves occupied and uh, use those facilities which are now ones of a kind one of a kind Thank you very much for giving this very, very encouraging and inspiring talk. I'll hand you over to uh, Shikanji to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful session. And your closing remarks were also really good. And as you said, now the people don't have to look westward to get the new technologies. They will be available here, right here in India. And it is not only for certain set of, I mean, the, the applications and the, poss the possibilities are quite, quite large. I think there's a good thing happening in India. 